talk to young mothers who have children who are coming in to have shave ice, and you say, we're the only ones who offer this. It's, you know, it's real ingredients. This is real food that you're eating. This is not just junk and chemicals. Whereas, you know, a lot of shave ice is around this. It's just junk and chemicals. What mother would ever take their kid to another shave ice besides yours? Right? It's pure, pure kind of green economy, but pure benefit, right? Um, so, I um, want to launch into some of the um, micro, uh, small scale kind of stuff we talked about a little bit at the beginning. I, I was fortunate enough recently to interview Jeff Hollander, who's the co-founder of 7th Generation, former CEO of 7th Generation, only because he has a small break in his schedule after he got fired as CEO of 7th Generation and uh, unexpectedly had a lot of time on his hands. And I happened to hit him up right at that moment and say, would you mind getting an interview? And he, he granted me this interview, which was awesome. Um, his great quote uh, that I love is just, he said, you know, right now, I asked him a lot about when he started 7th Generation, what, what did you face, and all these same obstacles you're going through, he, he does the same thing with 7th Generation, he just started everything in his garage, and he faced every obstacle, these hundred things that he had to do, but he was also trying to be sustainable and all this stuff. And he said, you know, these days, my job would have been a lot easier. He started his company 20 years ago. And he was fighting this gigantic uphill battle. He said, you know, these days the awareness and the consumer is so much higher and people appreciate this stuff a little bit more and, you know, there's more opportunities and there's more, you know, you couldn't even get compostable takeout where 20 years ago and that sort of thing. So he said, he said this is the best time right now with this economy turning down and a lot of people looking for work and a lot of people looking for meaningful work, you can find great employees and there's just all this opportunity out there. So he said... He said that quote, and I, and I just love that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about job growth, and this is obviously something big in Hawaii. We have so many of our jobs come from the service industry. We have money raining on us from tourism and from the military, and it's been that way for a long time. But how do we, as a state, go about developing a truly sustainable economy? And there's a great article. It's, um, I've got it over here. It's from the Harvard Business Review. And it was entitled The Secret to Job Growth. And they talked about how communities often do what they call chasing smokestacks with tax breaks and incentives and, and that sort of thing. So a community will, uh, a community board, whether it's a city council or whatever, will give a tax break to a Walmart to move in to their community to create jobs under the, under the premise that they're going to be creating jobs. So they'll try and lure a manufacturing plant into their community. They'll, they'll be chasing smokestacks. But they may be actually shooting themselves in the foot. So this was a 30-year study on employment growth rate uh, over time. And they looked at about 300 different cities. Uh, I'll talk about where Honolulu was in a little bit. But um, So this measure, number of firms per worker, is just an idea of size, average size of a company. So this is bigger company, smaller company. And what they found was this regression was, it was almost linear, where Communities that had smaller companies that were more, had a lot more smaller companies had tremendous job growth. And communities that had bigger companies had much less job growth. It's very interesting. So if anybody wants to see the article. And I know that the Department of Labor here, I've been talking with those guys a little bit, and they get that. And I think, um, you know, our governor gets that. And I've definitely seen a lot of interest in creating small, small companies because these are the ones where most of the jobs are coming from. One of the key takeaways I, I would like to have you guys walk away with today is the, the influence of buying local and buying green, voting with our dollars in essence. So this was a, a study done uh, by an independent nonprofit group uh, studying local community development. And they looked at what happened with 100 bucks spent, so if that represents $100. $100 spent at a local store, like Down to Earth, or $100 spent at a, at a big box store. And what happened to it? How much of this money is recycled back into the state of Hawaii, into your local community? And it was so clear, almost three times as much money gets recycled back in when you shop at a, at a local store. So I think you're going to start to see from our government a lot more push for buy local campaigns and buy green campaigns. But as consumers, going and spending our money at the House of Pure Aloha <coughs> makes a lot more sense than going to KFC and getting uh, you know, some sort of a dessert kind of thing. So if
if you are going to start a business, you know, the ultimate goal is success. So a lot of what I'm going to go through here is for social entrepreneurship, but this is equally good job skills if you are just looking for a green job. So going back again to this ability to commu communicate the green economy, Amy Cosper, the editor of Entrepreneur Magazine, wrote this. What makes a company brilliant is hard to measure, and it differs from company to company, but there are common threads that link them together. Simplicity and clarity from idea to execution, sureness of self reflected in a company's success and presence, be able to explain it in two sentences or less, simple, obvious, curious, playful, and innovative, that's what you need to be. And I was having a conversation with a guy the other day about my business, ironically, and how I was doing workshops, and I was doing this online gig, and then I was uh, cre I'm actually creating a green economy board game, and it's got a a lot of things going on. And he looked at me and said, well, what about, you know, as a business model, what about the guy who just creates a bunch of widgets and sells them? I said, damn that guy. It's a lot, much, much simpler business model than mine. So if you can, if you can communicate Hopa in two sentences, which I think you're pretty good at, you're well on your way, right? Same kind of thing if you're working for a company, if you're able to communicate it, you're going to be a better salesperson. You're going to be able to relate better to your other employees or colleagues. There's perhaps my favorite green entrepreneur in the world, an entrepreneur, who wrote this book called Let My People Go Surfing. <laughs> you guys get a chance to pick it up. It's awesome. Uh, Somebody's read it? Yeah. Read it. Yeah. Um, and his, you know, he, he argues this whole concept of can success include sustainability? And he really comes to the conclusion, can it not include sustainability? As we talked about before, the unsustainability of unsustainability is, is just true. And so if you don't start your company with some aspect of sustainability, you're shooting yourself in the foot for long-term growth. So Chouinard had this quote, I think entrepreneurs are like juvenile delinquents who say, this sucks, I'll do it my own way. I'm an innovator because I see things and I think I can make it better, so I try it, that's what entrepreneurs do. Funny side element to him, just to relate him more to Hawaii, he's an avid surfer, and at one point, Either Adidas or uh, one of the other big apparel makers wanted to buy out Patagonia and move the corporate headquarters uh, to Stony Brook, Illinois, or something. Andre is laughing, so I think you know this story. And he he vetoed the sale because he said, "Ah, there's no surfing in Stony Brook." Huh. Okay, and to go back to Elise's video, and this, we're so glad you, you put that video in. I won't ask you to read this. I'll read it for you, but. Now, people say the economy is not good, is this a good time to start, start a business, there's all these obstacles. But at least you don't have these problems. I have, I have a friend who was doing some work in rural Zimbabwe, and her quote was, a fledgling small business in rural Zimbabwe faces many obstacles. A limited market, unreliable transportation, witchcraft. Our group is supporting four local cooperatives in their new business ventures, beekeeping, raising poultry, growing vegetables, and growing chilies. The workshop focused on developing a business mindset. The presenter asked what kinds of cultural barriers might get in the way of achieving success in business, and belief in witchcraft was a big one. The participants acknowledged that they believed a successful person probably had supernatural support. They also said they might be hesitant to become too successful for fear their community will become envious and use witchcraft against them. So at least you don't have these challenges. <laughs> not using witchcraft, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the <laughs> so I'm just going to go through some, we're going to kind of blow through these. These are entrepreneur success factors, and these are great things that you, if you can incorporate these as habits, it will help you in any job, but it will also help you as an entrepreneur. And this is a lot of accumulated research and materials I've put together, sort of like the seven habits of highly successful people and a lot of other things, but these are what I found to be the most successful uh, habits of people who start businesses and are successful at them. This is a big one, and, and I think you touched on this a little bit, building systems. And so, I, I love biomimicry because we can learn a lot from nature. You can see these are fish swimming in a, in a river, and the river's moving this way. And the fish, through evolutionary time, have learned that if they just hang out, food will kind of come past them, and they don't have to chase it all the time. It's a system. Now, it's kind of a silly example, but when you build systems in your business, it saves you substantial time, energy, and money. You've got those hundred things that you need to do. If you can create a system such that you can detach your mental energy from all the day-to-day nitty-gritty stuff and let that go into some sort of a spreadsheet or some sort of a, 
a Google Doc or something along those lines, it makes your life a lot easier. This is one we actually happen to use in my company. And I know that on the first Tuesday of the month, I've got those three things to do. Now I can cross those things off out of my brain, and I don't have to think about them anymore until I show up to work Tuesday morning, and I say, what do I got? Oh, got to write a newsletter. Bing, bang, boom. Got to write a blog article. Bing, bang, boom. Good to go. Focus is a big one. Eliminating distractions and managing time well. This is a, this is a, I'll, I'll give you guys a quick trick. Has anyone worked an entire day, eight hours or nine hours or whatever, and then gone out afterwards, talked to a friend, how was your day at work? Like, God, I was working really hard. Well, what'd you do? Don't actually know. <laughs> I seemed like I was busy all day. <laughs> so, has everyone had this experience? I think I have this experience at least once a week. So if you can manage your time well, and I'll, I'll give you a quick trick for that, take, a, take your cell phone and put it on a timer and give yourself an alarm. Work for 60 minutes with no distractions. Turn your phone off, don't check email, don't look at Facebook. Just work for 60 minutes on something. And then at that 60 minutes, your buzzer goes off and you detach. This research kind of shows that that's the amount of time that your brain can really focus on something. And then if you cut it off right there, then you have a boundary. You say, okay, I'm gonna put that aside for now. And then take 40 minutes to check your email, return phone calls, et cetera, et cetera, communicate with the outside world. And then take 20 minutes and go for a walk and relax and just breathe. And then you come back and you have 60 minutes. If you try this once, you're basically only working four hours that day. Right? If you do this four times in a day, try it. And let me know how productive you are. I think, I think it's absolutely magic. Being organized, I don't want to even go into this one, but if you spend half your day looking for stuff, you're not going to be very effective. Um, discipline is huge. Uh, this was a cool article from... Washington Post, self-discipline may be smarts as a, as a key to success. Ross Perot had a great quote on this about, you know, if you can stay disciplined at that moment where you feel like you're achieving success, and then you feel like, oh, I, I could let go now. If you can stay disciplined and stay on top of it, that's when you'll start to see exponential growth. I put up these two guys. These were two of my kind of childhood heroes, Doug Flutie and Larry Bird. These are two of the most gangly, unathletic, short, <laughs> Doug Flutie was like five foot eight. <laughs> um, short, uh, just not, I, mean, I don't think Larry Bird could even dunk. No. Could he? No, he couldn't. Okay. Um, but yet, this guy would shoot 300 or 400 free throws every day and became just a dominant force Hall of Fame basketball player. So, anyway, discipline is huge. Who's seen Tommy Boy? There's this great scene in Tommy Boy where, where Chris Farley has been failing in every sales job he has, or every, every moment in sales meeting he has, until he hits the one where he just gets super passionate, he ends up lighting something on fire and knocking over a desk, and he's super passionate, and that's when he makes his first big sale, and that's, he's like, oh my god, did that work? And I was just being myself. And it's clear, if you're passionate about what you do, and I think Andre will tell you about it, and Bronson will tell you about it, if you're, if you're passionate about Revolution or Hopa, then clearly you're going to communicate that better to your customers and they're going to appreciate it more. The last one is, is horse sense. And I think a lot of times we're very guilty of this, where we see something we want, and this is the route we somehow take to go get it. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> do this instead. Uh, <laughs> Alright, and the, the most important success factor for an entrepreneur is not to burn out. Take care of yourself, please, because we, we like Hope Bob, we want to see it succeed. We want to make sure that you are you know, drinking enough water, doing yoga, <laughs> spending time with your buddies, recharging your batteries, going outside, remembering. So many of us get into this because we love hiking and we, we love the outdoors and we, we want to protect stuff. And we, get into green entrepreneurship because this is what we love. And then we'll go two years without going hiking because we get super busy. And sometimes you just got to lay on a couch and read a book and recharge your batteries. So let's get into some local stuff and some cool opportunities. Um, I love that we talked a little bit before about how this is not rocket science. None, none of this stuff is really rocket science. The principles of the green economy, are they alive and well in Hawaii? We have a connection to the land, do we have local production, do we have a spirit of entrepreneurship, do we have strong communities, do we have all these things? I think the one thing that I'd say we probably don't have is a diversified economy. We, we 
get too much of our money through tourism and military. I don't know about self-reliance. And self-reliance? Yeah, That's true. But we have so much. You know, when you when it comes down to it, we have so much. We have organic baby stores, we have Pacific Biodiesel, we have a CSA that delivers fresh vegetables organically. We have a worm company. San Francisco didn't even have a worm company. <laughs> There's organic farms and markets and sustainable forestry and organic salons and sustainability consultants and, and Revolut Sun. I mean, there's, there's so much. If anybody hasn't eaten at Sweet Home Wine Manolo, but that's one of my favorites. They're actually growing most of their lettuce on the roof. Pretty cool. So again, back to this report, these guys, uh, oper they, they identified a lot of opportunities for future growth. The, the real focus for most of this stuff was on needs. I mean, just basic needs. We, this is the stuff that's it's almost a guarantee. There's, a, there's always going to be a market for this stuff. So if we start creating this stuff here locally in Hawaii, then you know, the businesses can succeed. We're not, we don't have to invent anything here. We, there's, there's nothing crazy. Nobody's asking you to create a, a solar-powered submarine that takes tourists around and shows them coral reefs. So you don't have to go that far to be a green business. You can, you can create food. You can, you know, divert waste from the landfill. You can, you can create housing solutions. So biofuels is a big one that they identified. We use 80%, 90% of our uh, electricity. These lights comes from burning diesel fuel. If we create biofuels, it's not just used for transportation, it's used for energy, there will always be a market for that. And how great is that as an entrepreneur to always have a market, a guaranteed market for your product? Nobody has that kind of guarantee. Energy efficiency, there's so much of a need for energy efficiency consultants. I'm, I'm surprised there aren't 20 of them in this room. Green building and maintenance, this is where the DLIR, DLIR report says is the biggest growth area going forward. And then of course, specialty agriculture. I mean, you know, creating, creating a salsa and jarring it locally, if you use North Shore hydroponic tomatoes and uh, onions from Mal Farms, you can make a really nice salsa, jar it, and start selling it locally. Why not? This isn't rocket science, but these are green jobs and green businesses. Right? None of this has to be rocket science. Where's the bike rental place in Waikiki? Anybody know a bike rental place in Waikiki? I don't either. I do. You do? Yeah, there's an electric bike place. Oh, an electric bike, okay. There's I didn't know they, that. They, no, they cater for Japanese tourists, so the yeah. signs are all in Japanese. It's really hard to find though. I mean, you would think that a bicycle rental place would be pretty easy to find. A lot of people would choose the bicycle over the moped or whatever else. It might, it might be cheaper, they might, have, they might want to get some exercise. That's a green business. What about a pedicab server? That's a green business. Yeah, one. One in Chinatown. Yeah, there's one guy. One, one, yeah. one, one guy. One in Chinatown. Yeah, first Friday he was out. Nice. Oh, very cool. Yeah, how about a zip car? I mean, it definitely needs to be a car sharing service here. This was my first business that I started. I started a company with $5,000 installing organic gardens for people in Salt Lake City, Utah. That's what I did when I was 24. And I loved it. I was working outdoors every day. I was producing food. I was able to leave a bag of food with people. Every week I'd come back and I'd pull weeds and I'd you know, harvest whatever little cherry tomatoes were growing and put a bag of produce on somebody's front porch. It was a great business. I really enjoyed it. started with $5,000. I was profitable by end of year one. And it also allowed me to take my winters off and go travel and go skiing a lot, which was awesome. What about an outdoor gear exchange? Who, I mean, has anyone gone shopping for a kayak on Craigslist? We are just having this conversation with Chris the other day, and I, I swear it is a disaster. I mean, Craigslist is a total disaster. There is, there is nothing but scams and idiots on Craigslist. And I know, because I'm one of them. <laughs> Which one? Scammer and idiot. <laughs> I mean, you show up and there's like a giant, you know, you know gash in the back of the kayak and the, oh, sorry, the, the, the paddle's actually broken. We didn't, you know, we had it taped up on the picture on Craigslist. Where is our consignment store where people can buy and sell these things used? There's so many military folks coming and going and leaving kayaks and leaving surfboards and, you know, there's so little of this. How about making local foods? We talked about uh, salsa. This is kombucha. Um, this is a home energy rating service. Pretty easy. You can start that business with 3000 bucks worth of equipment, and you make a lot of money and you do a lot of good. 
This is ecotourism. Take people out in a biodiesel vehicle and show them some cool birds. Take them on hikes that they would never get to as tourists uh, on their own. You make a business out of that. It costs nothing to get started. So here's your key takeaways so we can go to Pauhana and have a beer. Hawaii needs you. Hawaii needs you. We, we face a lot of challenges. And the, the, the thing about a challenge is that if you're an entrepreneur and your mindset's as an entrepreneur, you don't see a challenge, you see an opportunity. But we as a state, we face so many challenges and it creates so many opportunities. You can totally be part of all these solutions. And the other key takeaway I want you to have is to buy local and buy green. Support Hopa and other businesses like them that are trying to do the right thing so we can create the kind of Hawaii we all want to live in. You're, you're cycling money into the local green economy. It's the most powerful force. Every day we go shopping and we, and we vote with our dollars. And if you vote in the wrong place, then you end up with the wrong society that you, want, that you end up living in. We all want to live in this cool community where there is community and there is businesses like Hopa. Oil companies and corporations based in Atlanta don't need your money as much as Hawaii does. So, that's that. Um, I want to close with Mahalo. Um, I love Gandhi's quote that, be the change you want to see in the world. We are, you know, you guys are the, the change that we want to see in the world, and you're the reason that I do what I do with GreenBusinessOwner.com. We're grateful for, your, grateful for your presence and look forward to continuing to serve you and work with you guys. I want to give you guys a couple of resources if you want to get in touch. Um, it's my name, my email address, my office phone. If anybody wants a copy of my book, I'm giving them away for free on my website, greenbusinessowner.com slash book. Uh, you can check out these three websites I think are really good for social entrepreneurship. Uh, my own, greenbusinessowner.com, ecopreneurist.com, and triplefunded.com. Uh,